In these first few days of class, you've been introduced to a lot of information, definitions, etiquette, labeling by multiple professional fields, but today we're going to dig deeper and look at the models of disability that we may unconsciously pack along with us, hence the suitcase images and the slides. How we treat others and the assumptions and actions that we take reflect models of disability that we buy into, whether consciously or unknowingly. We have implicit biases, especially against minority groups. We may not intend to outright discriminate or treat poorly, but we may carry around unspoken beliefs that do in fact bias us against those with disabilities. Today, we're going to unpack, pardon the pun, six models of disability. Some have a long history, while a couple are newer to the field. The goal of today's lecture is really to understand each of these models, the point of being able to create examples for each or even a skip for each. So please refer to the models handout posted on Moodle as we walk through this presentation together. So let's begin with the model handout. You can see the very first model is the moral model. It has different biblical perspectives some may take in responding to a disability. Disability is the result of the fall or a sin committed by the individual or family or a thorn in the flesh given by God to foster their spiritual growth. These are some of the common moral viewpoints people might put out there. Most see it negatively, such as a thorn in the flesh, and some even go so far to say it's due to sin, which has no biblical basis in most cases, as the passage in John 9 reminds us. Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. Some, like Johnny Erickson Tata, who was paralyzed due to a diving accident, sees disability as a gift or purpose by God to be used to bring others to him. Others in the Pentecostal tradition may believe that disability can be cured through prayer and laying on of hands. My friend Kathy, a blind Pentecostal, went to many of these healings but never was healed. So some of these beliefs can turn into spiritual abuse. She was told her faith was weak, hence why she was not being healed. I resonate, however, with a couple of theologians, Dr. Stanley Harawas and Thomas Reynolds, who argue that we are part of a systemic problem in which you and I participate in a cult of normalcy, and we all require this ongoing transformation by God's love in the context of our human frailty. Reynolds goes on to say, this is why I believe that the very notion a disability strikes to our core, forcing our theological reorientation as Christians. Disability is not simply about them. It is about us and our human frailty in multiple ways. Christian scholar Stephen Jockel argues that we can't get caught up in the theodicy of suffering, but to move forward in restructuring individual and systemic disabling attitudes. Stanley Harawas shares that the real task is to be present to others, and this requires moral skills gained in relationships of interdependence and not in cognition propositions. Instead of moralizing disability, it's imperative to spend time working to make systems accessible and to change these ableist perspectives. It's really an issue of social justice, which I see Jesus ministering to the needs of people with disabilities that were and are typically marginalized and creating social inclusion as a result. The next model has a long history, the medical model. It typically only sees the disability through this negative lens as a problem that needs a fix or a cure. There's two dimensions in the medical model, normalcy and pathology. It usually renders the individual with disability as passive and really doesn't respect their own knowledge about their body and their selves. It can increase paternalism, as a medical professional may believe that they know best for the patient and dispense their advice in a one-sided conversation that may know very little about the disability with a lack of exposure or training applied to people with disabilities. In a recent study, only about a quarter of medical schools included some type of curriculum on disability awareness, um, according to this University of Minnesota team of researchers. The number one reason given for why it wasn't included in the curriculum was that no one was advocating for it. The next reason was time and space. Yet, I don't want to paint this bleak picture. Not all medical professionals lean toward objectifying people with disabilities with medical jargon they use or the way they interact with patients. 
Many have discovered helpful, helpful therapies and surgeries and assistive technology that's improved the lives of those with disabilities. For example, the cochlear implant is one intervention that has helped restore some hearing to deaf individuals, although that itself is also a controversial issue in the deaf community. Some would argue it's destroyed deaf community and culture as they have a beautiful language of ASL, this shared history, and this tight-knit community. The problem I have with the medical model is that it assumes that a disability is automatically a problem, doesn't recognize some of the benefits that can come along with it, and it seems to say that differences or disabilities are not okay and just have to be fixed. So in stark contrast to that, we're going to take a look at the social model. And in this particular model, Disability is a social construction. The key idea is that the social and physical environment can either cause, define, or exaggerate a disability. According to this model, changing that interaction between the individual and society is the remedy, and you do that through advocacy. When the Americans with Disabilities Act was passed in 1990, there was an environmental shift. It transformed the meaning of disability and focused more on the interactions between the environment a lack of curb cuts or accessible phones, inaccessible jails, and public transportation. It really didn't blame the individual, it looked at the environment. Protesters with ADAPT once chained themselves to the White House gates and they couldn't be transported or jailed because neither were accessible. It literally proved the point of why federal legislation was so necessary and presented this social model view of disability. Another current day example hits closer to home in our churches. Nancy Iceland gives an example from her book, A Disabled God, where the choir director wouldn't allow the woman without arms to participate in the choir as it would be too distracting to the other parishioners. It's a perfect example of a disabling attitude that precludes inclusion in a community, and in this example, a faith community. Although the functional rehabilitative model sees disability negatively as a condition to accept, or overcome, it's also most related to employment and functionality and is considered to be more of an economic model. The idea of being an overcomer comes along with this model, with this emphasis on overcoming, but it really can lead to the negative stereotype that you either have to be a super crip or you're just not accepted just for who you are. The model focuses on functional limitations, the use of accommodations and assistive technology to make the most of functional activities, such as employment and completing household tasks. It helps us understand, too, why some disabilities can be more disabling than others. For example, those who love to hike or enjoy physical activities, they would be more impacted by a mobility impairment. However, Stephen Hawking, the famous theoretical physicist, he considered his ALS to be an advantage as it allowed him to think more. This model came out of the first two world wars when so many men and women returning with disabilities gained through the wars and rehab psychology and medicine were birthed to meet these veterans' needs. The next model, the cultural model, is a way of seeing disability as a product of the ways that cultures use differences to narrate, organize, and interpret their world. How we see disability is a reflection of the many larger cultural belief systems, and it's dynamic and fluid. This cultural model arose in direct reaction to the extreme focus on the social environment and those social interactions between disabled individuals and their environments. Critics felt the social model didn't really account for the cultural influences on disability and how it is perceived from cultural belief systems. For example, the Chinese at one point in time did not see foot binding as a disability, which would make someone not unable to walk, but they saw it as a sign of opulence and wealth. And another example from the fascinating book by Jan Fadiman, When the Spirit Catches You and You Fall Down, she captures the cultural collisions between the medical world and a traditional Hmong family whose daughter has these severe epileptic seizures. One of the religious cultural beliefs was that having epilepsy meant you were marked for the role of a shaman and played an important role in the community. Cultural beliefs also impacted the family's desires to follow certain treatments or not and so forth. How we see disability is really a reflection of the many larger cultural belief systems that are built upon narratives of people's stories. Yet one can challenge to choose to challenge those cultural influences. The last model has been put forth by a disabled clinical psychologist from South Africa. Dr. Watermeyer really focuses on the uniqueness of each individual's perspective. 
like a really good psychologist, looking at those individual differences. He acknowledges the social milieu and influences, but he also emphasizes the interpersonal mechanisms of prejudice and lived psychological predicaments of being disabled. He focused on the, intern on the internalized psychological struggle of individual oppression or inequality, and also the collective structural oppression. For example, lower paying wages for women and men with disabilities than those without disabilities. He goes on to argue for a psychoanalytic therapy to unpack unconscious narratives of inequality. He argues that the world sees disability either as one who's an invalid or one who is this super crip with no continuum in between. It's a stereotype to view all people with disability in mourning for the loss of an ideal body. Humans don't separate losses relating to the ramifications of disability from other losses in their lives. Loss is a prominent theme in therapy for those with and without disabilities. He also argues that disability can be especially threatening as in a very real sense, it awaits us all. Our bodies are aging, will fail most of us in ways we see in our disabled lives. A commonly held unconscious fear is that if we are imperfect, we will be rejected and left alone by others, leading to a painful life of isolation. That's partly why others distance themselves from those with disabilities. We fear, and so we other those with disabilities. We think, hey, no, that is in you, not me. Watermeyer argues that there is emotional oppression that occurs instead of denying loss, as per some versions of the social model might do, it's really essential that disabled people turn to a careful, authentic claiming of loss, free from categories and sanctions of politics, psychology, and popular culture, and to really recognize loneliness, feelings of abandonment and loss are elemental to life we share as our need for care and closeness brings a corresponding vulnerability. It's not the feelings of rejection and loss experienced by disabled people out there which we fear, but our own. He argues that getting to know these less often trodden parts of ourselves brings to light human commonality, which can lead to this more caring society. To really sum this model up, it's a little more challenging to understand. This model emphasizes unique unpacking of internal stru struggles of individual and structural oppression for wholeness, and that disability identity includes acknowledging these disparate elements and not brushing over it like the social model kind of emphasizes and just focusing on the environment that needs to change.